whenever it rains, the trees direct a certain amount of the rainfall to the bark. And this bark is, is uh, set up in these uh, elaborate patterns to direct rain all the way around the tree. Wow, really? Yep. And in these crevices where bugs and ants and other critters live, uh, you get a lot of exoskeletons that are shed in here. That then uh, is dissolved by the rainwater. It runs down and it carries the phosphate from the bugs and the manure of bugs down into this. All of this organic material at the base here is what feeds the tree. So it's, it's like a constant recycling of, of the material of life back into life. Well, I don't think economics are related only to humans at all. It's very easy to see nature as an economy. Nature creates value constantly for the benefit of all its, its membership. And that's what I think economics are really all about. Here you have a, a kind of banking of resources, you know, that every element in this forest contributes to. So it's more like a community of contributors and you take what you need as you need it. So, uh, you know, there's, there's like a, a bank, like at the bottom of that fir tree, there's this bank of resources and it's, it's available to the tree, it's available to fungi, to the earthworm, to termites, to whatever comes along and needs it. And each, con each time someone takes something, they generally contribute something. There isn't that kind of profit motive or interest or any of that in natural systems. It really isn't necessary uh, to have more than you need unless somehow you're acculturated to that belief system. So there's a kind of scarcity boogie bear in human culture that always has us feeling as if there isn't enough or there's not going to be enough. So we've got to quick uh, gather as much as we can and store it where no one can get to it and steal it from us or rob us or whatever. Uh, and then it doesn't really matter if we even use it. Most people's experience with money is that money is scarce. And in today's monetary system, it is scarce. These cultural lies uh, on which our relationship with money rests and is rooted uh, is really governed almost completely by the most insidious and tragic lie, which I believe is the lie of scarcity. Even the Federal Reserve publications claim that what gives money its value is its scarcity. And this is false. It's not the scarcity that gives money its value. When we're talking about credit money, what gives it value is its ability to requisition whatever you want or need from the marketplace. We actually swim in a set of unexamined, unconscious beliefs. And we look out into the world and we just uh, fear that there's not enough to go around without any evidence really. And then we make that true. The domination model artificially creates scarcity. And that scarcity is one of the ways that the system actually maintains itself. Not only material scarcity, emotional and yes, spiritual scarcity. I mean, well, I mean, what does it mean to have enough money? I mean, I, I guess you always want a little more. There's not enough time. There's not enough money. There's not enough sleep. So it's a constant battle with there's not enough. We don't have enough. It's not enough. I'm not enough. And that is a mindset. It's a, uh, it's an unconscious, unexamined mindset that creates distorted behaviors that are inconsistent with who we are. The same thing that keeps a rich person from giving is the same thing that keeps a poor person from making. It's that conditioned way of thinking and seeing. 
that we have to really begin to address. Those who consider themselves poor in this country are not poor. I think it's a this scarcity mentality. You know, I think it's, you know, it's a belief system that we all carry. And that there's not enough uh, belief system has a second part to it. There's not enough to go around and someone somewhere is going to be left out. And that inevitable fear or certainty that there's not enough to go around and someone somewhere is going to be left out is actually at the base of our political understanding of the world, uh, our systems of governance, our uh, educational system. It's even at the heart of religion. Of course there are scarcities that happen naturally. There's a disaster, there's a flood. Uh, all kinds of things can happen. But here you have a system that artificially creates scarcity so that then you get people who really are fighting for the spoils and since there's so much control from up on top, it is a way of maintaining the disunity and the confusion of those on bottom. What it is, it's emasculated men. And what do men do when they're emasculated? They compensate with hypermasculinity. When you leave, particularly men, with no options, they get violent and they get destructive. I don't care where you're talking about. Go to Russia. Where do you think the Russian gangs are? Go to Northern Ireland. Go anywhere in the world. These devastating dynamics are engineered. So our experience of money as being scarce is an artifact of the money system. Uh, in a properly run monetary system, there will be no scarcity of money. This there's not enough to go around and someone somewhere is always going to be left out gives us this very difficult and unfortunate permission to leave people out. Because if someone's always going to be left out, then it's your job and my job to accumulate more than we possibly could ever use or need to distance ourselves from ever being one of those poor people who gets left out. At the point of view of the corporation, getting more, getting more and more and more, that is driven in part by greed, in part by the dynamic of trying to get profits, capitalism, but it's also driven by fear. Because if you don't do it, if you can't expand faster than the next corporation, they will get research money and they will get marketing money and they will beat you and may drive you out of the game. You're not quite as efficient in this plant as you ought to be by our calculations. This is the banker speaking. And so therefore, we're gonna either raise the cost of your credit and drive you to do bad things to your workers or to your community or to the environment in order to boost that return and boost your stock price. And we will lend to you under those terms only. The nice way of saying it is nice guys finish last. If you're callous to the effects on others, you, you have a potential to rise. The odds are that you can compete your way up. If you care and are socially concerned about others, you're at a tremendous disadvantage. So I think the competitive dynamic that we have does sort of weed out a, you know, a, a set of people for success. But I would say that what it weeds out for success is not competence, not creativity, not intelligence, but callousness far more often. Well, you know, I think if you look at how economies actually function, they function with both competition and cooperation. Um, and so I think, I think both can coexist. We, we have probably leaned more toward competition. And, and I think we could use more, more cooperation. But I, I think either one in, in its extreme can be dysfunctional. Competition does have its place in urging us to our highest level of uh, performance and fulfillment. But health is dependent on cooperation. We don't have the liver competing with the heart for blood and for nutrients. Uh, there is this inherent cooperation that leads to the health of the entire entity. The nature to which people are able to be social, civilized, um, sympathetic um, is, is quite amazing and it, it's in contradiction to the nature of the money. It's interesting that anybody, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're aggressive naturally or very sweet, 
and uh, cooperative naturally, if you're going to have to make the money to live, I make you a prediction, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to compete for it. Is that in nature out there? Is that the world that is that way? Or is it the money system that's between us and the world that is that way? I make the second claim. A lot of diversity here. We're, uh, we're starting to see a whole different array of plants come into being. So um, there's some lupins here. There's some strawberry, small uh, wild strawberry. Uh, this broom with the yellow blooms on it. This is a, a nitrogen fixer and uh, is stabilizing these slopes. And decomposters here, they're harvesting that broom. So what are these ants doing for the, the whole situation? Well, basically they're breaking carbon down. They're taking carbon, gathering it together, and breaking it down. Uh, you got a great uh, part of the Umbellifera family. This is uh, uh, yarrow. They're deep-rooted, so they bring a lot of minerals up from the parent material. They go below this sand and dig into more than silica to bring up things to the surface that'll, that'll nourish these other plants. So you've got a lot of complexity here. A lot of plants cooperating with each other to try and create an ecosystem that stabilizes this shifting sand surface here. Mm. Ecosystems are, are based much more on cooperation than they are on competition. We tend to deify cutthroat competition. And, and there is some competition in nature, but there, there's much more cooperation. Species move from competition to cooperation because they discover the economic value of cooperating. It is cheaper, more efficient. All you have to do is look at our Pentagon budget and see that a tiny fraction of it would really develop countries that we've been leveling instead. Um, very much more cost-effective to make friends of them than it is to keep them as enemies. Uh, we have eight billion people on the planet. There's a billion of those that are happy to work but can't. There are no jobs for them. Some would argue that these people are unemployed because they lack skills or because they don't want to work. And that may be true in a few cases, but in the vast majority, that's not the reason why they're impoverished. The reason why they're impoverished is because you have this scarcity of money. The first question I ask is, am I going to be stuck being a janitor forever? And they were like, oh, no, there's all kinds of chance for advancement. You could go to calling. We've got data entry. You've got all kinds of computer skills. And then four months passed, and I addressed it again and got a different story. It was like I had no value. My self-esteem was going down because I can do more.